This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University, and today I wanted to talk about Bitcoin and the end of history. I'm going to be referring to a famous book, which I already did in my title, called The End of History and the Last Man. This was published in 1992 and has been one of the most influential books of political philosophy written by Professor Francis Fukuyama. And the basic argument he made in this book is that in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, because this book was published in 1992, where the USSR, the Soviet Union, lost and the U.S. won, Fukuyama saw this as the triumph of liberal democracy over all other political systems. And he views history as this evolution that culminates in liberal democracy. And so with the triumph of liberal democracy over communism and Soviet-style socialism, this to Fukuyama meant the end of history. No more history, no more wars. Looking back on this, is this, this is an extremely naive view of history, especially when we consider what happened afterwards. The publication of Fukuyama's book coincides pretty well with the beginnings of the complete breakdown of American liberal democracy, which has only really accelerated in recent years. And this is how it always works. Democracies, even constitutional republics, always fail in the same way. I love this Titler quote. Uh, it goes like this. A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the public treasury. And this is exactly what's happening these days where the central bank, where the Federal Reserve is monetizing U.S. deficit spending and making all of us experience extreme inflation as a result of that. Teitler goes on to say, from that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury. You can imagine this is what we're going to see in 2024 as well, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilization has been 200 years, which is about the age, obviously, of the U.S., a little bit more. These nations have progressed through this sequence from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to apathy, from apathy to dependence, from dependence back into bondage. And I think we're somewhere there between apathy, dependence, and about to slip back into bondage with the rise of CBDC. So Fukuyama got it really, really wrong in his book. History did not end in the 1990s. In fact, it only accelerated. It took on more malignant new forms. For example, 2001 marked the beginning of the U.S. forever wars, which were themselves financed by Federal uh, Reserve uh, Central Bank money printing. 2001 also marked the beginning of China's ascent to power when it joined the World Trade Organization, the WTO. 2001 also marked the beginning of the 21st century attack on citizens' privacy and freedom, which is always ongoing, but it especially ramped up in the wake of what happened in 2001, including the, two, the uh, U.S. Patriot Act and the later developments, including, along with the rise of China, the rise, of course, of the CCP and social credit scores, and now CBDCs in China, in China, central bank digital currencies. So Fukuyama was quite wrong about liberal democracy, but I do think that, in a sense, history ended in the 19. 90s, and we're going to see how that progresses. I think it was actually rather than the end of the Soviet Union and the rise of the U.S. as the world's only superpower, actually it was the rise of cryptography that really can bring about the end of history in a good sense. The rise of cryptography in the hands of the common people that suggests that it might still be possible to escape from the nightmare of history. This is, of course, the cypherpunks who began to be very active in the late 80s and the 90s as well. Cypherpunks, as Wikipedia says here, any individual advocating widespread use of strong cryptography and privacy-enhancing technologies as a route to social and political change. We had the famous Cypherpunks Manifesto by Eric Hughes, and I'll just read you the first paragraph, which is quite well known. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. And this was really written even before the internet took off. Uh, for regular people. Privacy is not, a, is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the whole world to know, but a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. Privacy, and I love this quote, privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. And this, this should exist in a pre-digital world 
and what the cypherpunks argued is it should also exist in a digital world. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a comment, a suggestion for a future video. Also tell a friend about a about a Bitcoin University channel that would really help out the channel and its reach. One of the cypherpunks, a guy named Phil Zimmerman, in the late 80s or 90s invented PGP, which is a, f a form of encryption. And after doing so, he was immediately investigated by the US government for what they called munitions export without a license, treating encryption as a form of a weapon. Zimmerman retaliated by publishing PGP source code in a hardback book and then shipping that everywhere, which would equivalent be the equivalent of shipping arms overseas, according to the US government. Other people took similar code and put it on t-shirts and said, basically, you can't export these t-shirts because they contain cryptographic code. And so you're in violation of the government's ridiculous ban. The eventual conclusion after a couple different court cases was that cryptographic software source code and software in general, just like Bitcoin, is protected as free speech under the First Amendment, which is quite significant. I'll link to the PGP article in the description notes below. Here's an example of one of those t-shirts. You can see here it says, warning this shirt is classified as a munitions and may not uh, be exported from the United States or shown to a foreign national. And this was the natural form of protest. So this was what was happening in the 1990s. And I think this is really what laid the seeds, what planted the seeds that would lead to and will lead to the end of history. Of course, on Halloween, October 31st of 2008, Satoshi published the Bitcoin white paper, and then he got Bitcoin up and running in early January of 2009. And I think it's really with the invention of Bitcoin, obviously, that the cypherpunks come into their own and so many different threads are brought together by Satoshi. And what makes Bitcoin so really very important is for the first time in history, we have a way for everyday people to store their private property in a way that it cannot be debased. If the local fiat currency is being debased by corrupt politicians and their deficit spending, which is being monetized by the central bankers, Bitcoin will explode higher in those local currency terms thus preserving the purchasing power of those who hold it. And this is something that anyone can hold. You don't need a private bank. You don't need to have a high net worth and you able in order to be able to hold it. Here, for example, is a chart of the price of Bitcoin denominated in Argentine pesos. And we can see that it continues to hit new all-time highs, thus protecting the purchasing power of Argentinians who moved not just out of the peso and not just out of the dollar, but also into Bitcoin. So Bitcoin helps preserve the purchasing power of everyday people. Also, for the first time in history, we finally have a way for everyday people to store their private property, not just in a form that cannot be debased by central bankers, but also in a form where it cannot be stolen by governments. You can kill me, but you still won't get my Bitcoin. In fact, by killing me or any other Bitcoiner, you're basically making a pro rata donation to all the Bitcoiners of my lost Bitcoin if I die without revealing my keys thus enriching all those who still control their private keys on the Bitcoin network. If you strike me down as Obi-Wan Kenobi, you can imagine him saying, my Bitcoin, our Bitcoin will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. So really the invention of Bitcoin, which is the culmination of the cypherpunk movement, can be seen as marking the beginning of the end of history. And then hyper-Bitcoinization, when the world moves to a Bitcoin standard, would be essentially when history as we know it, have known it, ends globally, not in the sense of the end of the world, but in the sense of the end of history being just one damn thing after another, in which the main recurring theme is stronger people killing weaker people and taking their stuff. This is something that Bitcoin can prevent. For the first time in history, we have an asset that can be easily secured by any individual, and that asset cannot be frozen, turned off, or debased, as we always talk about on this channel. And that's really never existed before Bitcoin. Since governments can no longer threaten or kill their citizens to confiscate their wealth or steal their currency, steal their wealth through currency debasement and inflation, instead, because governments can no longer kill and steal, they can kill, but they can't steal because if they kill you, they end up donating your Bitcoin to the whole network. Instead, governments will be forced to behave more reasonably. Governments will, in fact, need to compete with other governments in order to attract the best and brightest and the most productive citizens of the world, which will be the Bitcoiners. This is the one way that Bitcoin, along with other freedom tech like censorship-resistant communication protocols like Noster, for example, help to bring about the end of history. Liberal democracy does not guarantee freedom, and it does not guarantee 
democracy, it ultimately leads to bondage, as we saw in the Titler quote. It's only Bitcoin that brings about the end of history and guarantees these basic freedoms, along with other freedom tech like uh, Noster. Here's a client, for example, you can use on iOS, on your iPhone to access the Noster protocol. And you can find me on Noster if you, I'll put a link to this description, this video in the description notes below. If you scroll down here, you'll see my NPUB key. You can connect with me on Noster. Basically just download this app on your phone and then you can copy and paste this NPUB and you'll see me pop up. I haven't been posting there too much, but if I were to get kicked off of this, this platform or off of Twitter, this would be one way to uh, connect with me and that we'd all be able to connect with each other using Noster and Noster cannot be censored or stopped by any government. If you want to explore more of these ideas, I encourage you to take a look at Eric Kaysen's new book called Crypto Sovereignty. He's a very hardcore Bitcoiner. He's talking about something different. He's not He's not pushing crypto, obviously. Uh, he's only talking about Bitcoin and its place in the history, uh, in, in world history and also in political philosophy. So this, this just came in the mail. I'm enjoying uh, reading it. So check that out. Also check out these two podcasts that were put out by Safe Adina Moose, Discussion Between Safe, Michael Saylor, and Dr. Patrick Newman of the Mises Institute, talking about Murray Rothbard's book, Conceived in Liberty, which is a very, very interesting history, sort of prehistory of the United States and all the different conflicts that happened between various governments, various state governments, and various groups leading up to 1776. So I'd encourage you to check out both parts. I found part two especially interesting. I'll put links in the description notes below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Also, let me know if you like this kind of video. It's a little bit more philosophical than my videos normally are, uh, that you may know about my academic background. So I sort of tend toward these kind of videos every once in a while. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.